All right, the part of the chapter here in Philippians chapter number 3 we're going to focus in is our verses 13 and 14. Now we're wrapping up, of course, 2016. We're right near the end of the year. We've got one more week before our year is over. And um, what we're going to be preaching on tonight is a sermon titled, Planning for the New Year. Oftentimes I, I will tend to preach a sermon as the year closes and a new one ends. But in the past, I've done it like right on, like maybe on New Year's Day or right when the, when the first happens. But I wanted to preach it a little bit earlier, one week in advance this year, in order to give you an opportunity to think about it, to think about this past year and to think about the coming year, to make preparation for yourself and use this time that, that's coming up to start moving forward and to progress in your Christian life and to start doing more for God and to get your priorities set, to get everything set up in your mind on what you want the next year to look like. If we think back about this year, you may have many successes, you may have many failures, you may have a lot of things that have happened, a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties. And what we get, gather here in Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is a, is a race, but it's not a sprint. The Christian life is a long race. It's an endurance race. We need to, to stay focused on the prize, on the end, on the goal, and not faint and not back down and not fall and stumble and get out of the race and get distracted with other things. You may have had a lot of problems this year. You may have had a lot of difficulties. You may not have gotten nearly as much done as you wanted to get done. You may have ended up backsliding this year. But one of the good things about coming up on a new year, it gives us an opportunity to just reset things, to just start over. It's like a new day. I'm, I thank God for the days. Thank God that the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And that every single day that sun comes up again is a fresh start. It's a new day to move forward forward. See, what we don't want to get stuck doing is dwelling on the things of the past, dwelling on all the things that have already happened, especially our failures. But we also don't want to be dwelling on our successes of the past and just glorying in those and, and stopping from doing more and continuing to work and starting to get too lazy and lackadaisical because of the fact that we think we've done so much already. We need to continue to press forward. We need to press for the, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Press towards that mark. That mark is set really high. So ask yourself, maybe you haven't even thought about this yet, what is your vision for the new year? What are your plans? What are your goals? What do you want to do in 2017? We read this already through the, when we did our Bible study through the book of Proverbs that we just closed up. Proverbs 29, 18 reads, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. We need to have a vision in our life. We need to be setting goals. We need to be thinking about what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? How am I going to serve God next year? We need to plan it out. If you just deal with everything just completely on the fly, no. there's going to be a lot of things that you're not going to get done because you weren't prepared for them. I'll tell you this right now. There's a lot of things that you can do that are good things that you could end up doing on the fly. But you're not going to accomplish any great work. You're not going to get a, a major project done. You're not going to achieve great goals without doing some planning. Any great work that you want to do requires planning. It requires time. It requires you to devote time in preparation and getting ready. For example, just showing up to church if you take no time planning, no time prioritizing, and sometimes you just decide to go to church, well, you know what? That's what's going to happen. Sometimes you're going to end up going to church, and sometimes you won't. And it's not that big of a deal. But in order to be consistent, if you decide that, hey, this is important, I'm going to make this a priority, you have to plan for that. Oftentimes you're going to have to do that is you're going to have to know in advance, well, I'm already have church scheduled at this time, this time, and this time. I can't go those times. So when other things start to come up, you say, no, I have to work around that. It's called planning. 
if that's one of your goals, if you're going to try to make it in here all the time, um, start a, a, a bigger goal than that. And see, that's a minor one. That's a small thing. I think it's not that big of a deal to make it to church every week or to make it to church every time we have service. That's not that difficult to do. But how about, you know, doing a bigger work like starting a church, pastoring a church? That requires a lot of work, a lot of preparation. There's a lot of time spent reading, studying, praying, and doing just other work behind the scenes, getting ready just for this church to get started like we did three years ago. The bigger the work that you want to do, and let's face it, you know, starting a church is a lot more difficult and a much bigger task than attending a church where everything is already done for you. There are a lot of goals. You say, well, I'm not going to start a church. Well, that's fine, but there should be a lot of work and a lot of great things that you want to do for God. And you ought to be thinking about this. See, I don't know what that is. Start thinking about it. Start reading your Bible more. Determine what it is. Where is God's will for me? Where do I fit in in this church? What are my skills? What are I, my abilities? Where, where is my membership in this church fall in? What can I offer? You got to stop thinking, well, the church doesn't do this for me. The church doesn't do this for me. You got to start thinking, what can I do for the people here? What can I do for God? What am I good at? Where can I be utilized? What skills has God blessed me with? We need to have a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Do you have a vision for this church? I know I do. But you know what? The church isn't just me. I helped get this church started, but I am not the church. The church is everybody. Man, woman, boy, and girl. Doesn't matter your age. Your gender, you are everybody here, everyone in this room is part of this church. It's a group. And hopefully you have a vision for our church to grow. Hopefully you have a vision for our church to reach people. Hopefully you have a vision for our church to do more work for the Lord, to give the gospel to more people, to, to help out more, to do a lot more work. What is your vision? What, what is that vision? Once you have a vision, then you can start working towards that end result of that vision. But without the vision, there's going to be no work. You're not even going to be thinking about what you can do because you never set a goal. You never set a standard. You never thought anything, um, <clears throat> even probably even have to have a vision about the church. How about a vision for your family? Do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a vision, uh, especially parents, you have children that, that you want to raise? What is your vision for your children? How do you want them to grow up? What types of things do you want them to do or, or, or not to be a part of in this world? And what are you doing about that? What are you doing to prevent the worldliness? What are you doing to teach them the right ways? What are you doing to teach them the Bible? How about that? Do you want them to grow up to be great Christians, young, nice, nice Christian ladies and men? How much time are you devoting to teaching them God's word? I mean, you go think about your life day to day to day, and maybe you have nothing planned out in your life. Maybe you have some things planned out. Is the Bible part of that plan? Is preaching God's word and teaching what is really important in this life part of your plan? Is that something that you ever even think about? How about for yourself? Do you have a vision for yourself? Where do you, where do you fall in? What are you planning on doing this year? <clears throat> How do you plan on spending your time? What's your vision? Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself not just this year but at the end of your life? Because that's the end goal. We have a lifetime of things to do. What do you want to look back and see that you've accomplished? Have you thought about that? If you haven't, you should start thinking about that. Because once you know what some of those things are, you can start planning for them and making them happen and not just thinking, hey, it would be great if I can do this. It would be great if I could go so. It would be great if I can do whatever and then never do anything about it. You need to start thinking, no, this is a plan. This is a goal. I've got a lifetime goal. I've got a 10-year goal. I've got a five-year goal. And I've got a one-year goal and a daily goal. And they should all be consistent with each other on achieving those things. It's time to start thinking about these things. I don't know about you, but I hate excuses. 
To me, excuses are almost as bad as complaining. And you look up complaining in the Bible, murmuring. God killed a lot of people for their murmuring and their complaining and not being satisfied with the things that he gave them. When they weren't satisfied, the children of Israel weren't satisfied with the manna that God fed them in the wilderness. They didn't have to do any work for. All they had to do was go outside and collect it and eat it. He made it very easy for them to do. But what happened? They got sick of it and they started complaining. Murmuring, complaining. Oh, why do we have this? Oh, this is too bad. Oh, I wish we had other things. Oh, I remember the garlic and the fish and the leeks and, and everything else that we had in Egypt when we were in bondage. And God destroyed those people. And that's, that, I, I'm, I could understand that about God. I could understand that in his, in his uh, you know, you call it a personality or, or whatever with God. I get it. I hate to hear complaining also. We need to be very content with the things that we have and not be so disgruntled and, and so upset about the situations we're in. We ought to be thank, looking at the things that we're thankful for and appreciating those things instead of complaining about what we don't have. Be thankful for what you do have. But I think next to complaining is making excuses. People are real quick to make excuses. Well, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. I couldn't come to church tonight because whatever. And we got a lot of people that couldn't come to church tonight for whatever reason. It's time to stop making excuses. See, this fits in because when you make a plan, when you make a goal, and you want to start to do that, and if that goal has anything to do with serving God... You're going to face opposition. You're going to face the devil or whoever is going to, you know, people who hate God not wanting you to do what you're doing and not wanting you to serve God. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to try to put a stumbling block in your way. Things are going to come up. Or maybe you'll just be tested. Maybe you'll be tested by God to see, is your heart really in this? For example, you might make a, make a goal to say, you know what, I am planning on going to church every single service. And the only thing that's going to keep me out is if I'm deathly ill, if I'm in the hospital, if something like that comes up. Yeah, of course, that's understandable. But other than that, I'm going to be there every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm going to be in church. And then the very first week, what happens? You get a flat tire. Oh, I couldn't make it to church. I had a flat tire. And then something else happened. Someone, oh, I had a visitor come in and visit me. Oh, I couldn't make it to church because I had to entertain them. Oh, I have this guy. And, and there's excuse after excuse after excuse starts coming up preventing you from doing what you should do when you think about your goals and you think about your plans for the year there's some very very basic things that we need to be doing in this life in order to be right with God in order to do things that are pleasing in God's sight Think of how much Bible you have read this year. Personal Bible reading. I'm talking about the time that you spend listening to God directly from His Word. Directly from the Bible. Did you even read it cover to cover? Once. One time. Just, just every word of this book within the course of a year. If you haven't, why not? Do you have an excuse? I'm sure you do. There's probably a lot of excuses. Oh, I was busy. Oh, I had this come up. Oh, I had that come up. Oh, I had too many things to do. My life is too busy. It might be easy to tell yourself that, but when you think about that, just, just tell God. Tell God that's why. God, I didn't really want to listen to what you had in this word. I didn't really want to learn. I don't think it's that important in my life to spend 15 minutes in a day to get through the Bible in a year. It's just, it just, I got too many things to do for 15 minutes. Put it in perspective. What's your plan for next year? You know, we have Bible reading charts right on that bookshelf in the back so it could help you to mark off the chapters that you do. It gives you a plan so that you could stay on track just to read the Bible once in one year. And, I, and I'll tell you what, 
In my opinion, reading the Bible once in one year is a minimum. That is a, I mean, that is like, like you're just barely getting by, by by spending that little time reading your Bible. But that's my opinion. You do what you want with that. How much have you prayed this year? Prayer is important. Jesus spent hours praying. Jesus forsook sleep oftentimes to pray. Ask and you shall receive. Do you believe that? How much do you love others? How much do you care about them? You know, we have these prayer requests. We have these prayer lists that we spend updating every single week on people that we want to pray for. Does it mean anything to you or do you just leave your bulletins here at church and just throw them away on your way out and, and not really ultimately care about these things? You might give lip service to prayer, but are you praying? Are you praying for other people? Are you even praying for yourself? If you think about your vision for next year, 2017, how was your church attendance? And this is a big one. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on this because as the pastor of this church, I spend quite a bit of time preparing sermons to preach and studying God's Word. And I put in a lot of time and a lot of effort thinking about everybody in this church, thinking about the needs, thinking about, hey, what truth can I preach? What is it that God has in here that would be very, very beneficial every single week for various people to hear? And I spend time praying about it. And asking God about it and showing me, God, what can I preach here? What are some things that I don't know what's going on in this church, but what can I preach in this church that's going to be helpful to the people of our church? And there have been many times, I know for a fact, that God has been leading in the message and in the sermons based on, on conversations I have with people afterwards. And look, this is not self-glorifying at all because I'm not saying I even come up with this stuff. God's the one that, that, that it's His Word first and foremost, but I believe He's able to use the pastor or the preacher to speak to people with what's going on in their life at any given moment. But you know what happens when you're not here? You might be missing out on the very sermon that you've been waiting for, that you need something in your life that's going wrong, that you need to get fixed, and you're not here in service. Hey, it was preached, but you let some excuse come in the way for you not coming to church. Oh, it was Christmas Day. I can't go to church. I got to spend time with my family. Day we're supposed to be celebrating the birth of Christ. Yeah, let's not go to church on that day. Bible reading, praying, even just your basic church attendance. How about how much time did you spend out soul winning? Now in this church specifically and especially more than any other church I've been in, we have a lot of people that have a lot of different issues going on that might uh, legitimately, definitely prevent some people from going out and knocking on doors to talk to people. Now, it's not everybody, but there's a, a portion of our church where that's a problem. But soul winning isn't only about door-to-door -door soul winning. If you have legitimate physical reasons and you know, reasons that, that just you cannot go out and knock on doors, I understand that. And you know what? I think God understands that too. But you know what God doesn't understand is when you don't preach the gospel to people. When you come into contact with people. When you know that someone's unsaved. When you have a great opportunity to give someone the gospel and you don't do it. That's something that we're all called to do. How much time have you spent out soul winning? Now, none of these things, none of these things that you can do happen by mistake. You don't just walk down the street and go, hey, here's a church. I think I'll just go to church tonight and they just happen to be having a service right now. You plan for it. You know what time they're having service. You know where they're located and you show up. You don't just happen to think, oh, I feel like reading a book right now. What should I read? And you flip through your library, all the books you have. Oh, look, here's the Bible. I think I'll read that. No, you have to plan for it. You have to do it. You have to set it as part of your schedule to start reading. You don't just, um, you know, rat, you know we'll just on a whim pray. Usually people pray when they got something wrong in their life. 
But if you want to be doing serious praying, praying for other people, you have to plan for it. You have to schedule. You have to get your act together and have a plan and be prepared. Same thing with soul winning. All of these things you want to do, they don't happen by mistake. They all must be intentional or else if they are not intentionally done, you are rarely, if ever, going to do them. It'll be a rare occasion when you pray. It'll be a rare occasion when you go to church. It'll be a rare occasion when you read your Bible unless you are planning for unless you have intentionally decided, I am going to make this a priority and I am going to do this. Girls, sit down in your chairs and listen up right now. Our church has been suffering. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 6. Our church has been suffering with a lot of health problems. Our church has been suffering with health problems since its inception. For the past three years, we have had a lot of people in this church who have had various issues with their health. Many people experience physical pain in this church, real pain. I don't mean just minor stuff. I know there's a lot of people who, who experience serious stuff. And while I am completely sympathetic for everyone's individual situation, I really am because I have a wife that deals with extreme pain on a daily basis as a regular thing. And I know how difficult that be. And I know, I know how, how much that can drain you and how much that can affect your, even your mental state because it's, it's such a problem because that pain is just always there and it's a nagging pain and it just doesn't go away. I am sympathetic to the situation and I get it. However, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do with your life? Many people deal with these types of things. With my wife's case, it's an injury. Her body's broken in a way that, that probably can't be fixed and that the, the pain is just an outcome of that. It is, it is a result of that. Other people have other issues that they're dealing with within this church that brings them pain. But what are you going to do with your life? Are you just going to roll over and die? Are you going to let the pain just become an excuse not to do anything because it hurts? While I'm sympathetic, it's something that you have to decide what you're going to do. Our life here is short. Do you, if you're still here, if you're still here, God has a plan for you and a purpose. You're born again. You're saved. If God were done with you, you know what he would do? He would take you home. But the fact that you're still here shows me God's not done with you yet. If God's not done with you, I don't think you should be giving up on yourself. This life is extremely short. The older I get, the more I learn that just by experience, how quickly time goes by, how fast day after day after day, the days get shorter and shorter and shorter. The years start to fly by. And before you know it, you look back and you say, wow, where did all this time go? This is the time that we have to earn our rewards that are going to last an eternity. An eternity forever. The things that you do in this life matter forever. Galatians 6, look at verse number 9 and 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing. What does weary mean? Tired, exhausted, done. I can't do it anymore. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Say, so keep at the good work, because if you keep going, if you keep working, we're going to reap. But don't faint. You can't fall down. You can't just let, let everything go and, and, and do all this work and then faint and stop and quit. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This is the time that we have our life to make a difference in other people's lives. This is the time that we have to do something great for God. Are you going to look back on your life and wish you could have just toughened it out a little bit more and done a few more things for God? I hope not. 
I hope you can decide right now that I don't want that to happen in the future, so I'm going to stick it out, I'm going to tough it out, and I'm going to make sure I push myself to the limit to do as much as I possibly can do. Any great work that we do comes with a price. There is a cost involved with doing a great work. There is sacrifice involved. There is work. There is sleeplessness. There is all kinds of things that, that you put into something. If you, the, the greater the work you want it to be, the more you have to devote, the more time, the more energy. Any great work is also going to be difficult and require sacrifice. But you have to decide, are you willing to push yourself what are you going to do in this life? Are you going to look back and your life's just going to be filled with, well, I had pain, so I didn't end up really doing much because, you know, because, it was, because I had pain. You could use that excuse. You could be saved. You could use that excuse. You know what? You're going to get to heaven and you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ one day and all your works are going to be tried and they're all going to be burned up. Thank God you're saved and in heaven, but that's going to be it. I guarantee you there are going to be plenty of people there who probably went through worse than you went through yourself, and they're going to be standing before that judgment seat, and they're going to reap plenty of rewards. Why? Because they push themselves. Because in their mind and in their spirit, they decided, I'm going to do what I can do to the utmost for my God and Savior. I'm going to do everything I possibly can. I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to get through just one more day. I'm going to get through just one more day. I'm going to get through just one more week. I'm going to get through just one more month. I'm going to push myself and push myself because you know what? That's, our life is a string of every single day. But you have to have the plan. You have to have the vision. Before I even started this church, I didn't think I could do anything more with my time. I thought my time was already full. Guess what? It wasn't. And even right now, I couldn't imagine adding anything else. But I still think there's more that even I can do, be doing to serve the Lord and more time that I could be using wisely. Because, why? Because I've seen other examples of people doing even more. Nobody has a, a, a market on having any extra time. It's how well you're going to utilize that time and how driven are you, how motivated are you, how important is it to you to get these things done. Turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter number 1. Joshua chapter number 1, we're going to see this... Uh, Advice given to Joshua as he's beginning to lead the children of Israel, taking over the, the reins from Moses. Joshua has a big fight in front of him. Lots of fights, lots of battles. He's going in to conquer the Canaanites and to dwell in their land. But what a great inheritance. What a great reward as the outcome. But you know what? There's a lot of difficulty and a lot of challenge and a lot of work involved and a lot of putting forth your energy and, and really giving it your all in order to get things done. Look at verse number 6, Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and of a good courage. Very important words for this coming year. Be strong and of a good courage. Courage means you're not afraid. Courage means your spirits are lifted. You got your faith in God. You're ready to go. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide in an, for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Look, he repeats himself the second time. Be strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it. 
to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt, look at this, meditate therein day and night. Day and night meditating in God's word is what Joshua was told to do. Yeah, but how am I supposed to lead? I mean, I'm captain of an army. I need to lead these people. I've got a lot of planning to do. I've got a lot of work to do, God. I don't have time to meditate in your word day and night. What do you mean meditate in your word day and night? I've got all this other stuff to do. I've got battles to plan for. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. In order to have that good success, you need to properly prioritize what's important. Do you want to be successful in raising your children? Do you want to be successful in, in living a Christian life? Do you want to be successful in your own life? Meditate in God's word day and night that you can do what's right, that you can do according to all that's written therein and then have great success. Why? Because if you take the time first and foremost to meditate in God's word, you'll know what's right. You'll know what to teach your children. You'll know what to choose to do. You'll know the course that you need to take based on the foundation of this knowledge. But what you have is never enough. You, that's why you need to do it day and night. What you have now, you can forget if you don't keep up with it. That is why it's important to meditate day and night to keep this at the forefront. Verse number nine, have not I commanded thee? And look at for the third time, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. What I'll say to the people with the, with the ailments and with the problems and with the excuses, be strong and of a good courage. Get strength from God. Get the strength to keep going day after day after day. We need to be strong. Without being strong and courageous, you won't have the good success. You need to be strong. You need to keep mo moving forward. God will decide when he's done with you. And until then, we need to keep the mindset. We need to keep the planning. We need to keep the vision. I'm going to keep moving forward. You're going to run into your own limitations. And I understand that. But why don't you find out what those limitations are and push yourself to that regularly? Mom? The key is not to faint. We are in a marathon. This is the race we have before us. Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. What was Joshua told three times? Be strong and courageous. If you faint, your strength is small. Let's, let's make it so that we don't faint. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 40. Actually, you know what? Stay in, stay in Joshua. Because we're going right over to Joshua chapter 14 anyways. I'll read for you from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, the Bible reads, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? God doesn't faint. He doesn't even get tired. There is no searching of his understanding. Listen to this. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. We get our strength from the Lord. You need to be praying. Hey, have you been praying this year? Pray for God for strength. Pray that you don't be weary. Pray that you faint not. Rely on God to strengthen you. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten very few hours of sleep and then had to come in and preach on a Sunday morning, go out soul winning on a Sunday afternoon, and preach again on a Sunday night. Yeah. That requires a lot of strength. Yeah. And you know what? There's no way I could have done it through my own strength at all. 
You have to learn to rely on God to strengthen you. And if you keep your spirit and your mind refreshed and saying, no, this is more important. No, this is what I need to do. I know I'm weary. I know I'm tired. I know I just want to take a nap, but there's souls out there that need to be saved. And I've already determined that this is important, so I'm going to go out and do it. I'm going to push through the pain. I'm going to push through the weariness and the tiredness and just do it for one more day. Later tonight, I can finally get some rest and I'll get some sleep. But I'm going to push through it now. <clears throat> In Isaiah 4, we just read, he says, even the youths, they're going to get faint. They're going to be weary. But when you're relying on the strength from the Lord, he'll strengthen you. He'll keep you going. Joshua and Caleb were great examples. Joshua and Caleb were two of the men that came back when, they, when Moses sent out the, the, you know, 12 people to go spy out the land the promised land and, and just give a report. How did it look? What was everything going on? The majority of those people gave an evil report. They said, hey, the land's good, but you know, there's giants there and there's these people there and there's no way we're going to do this. There's, there's, there's no way we could win this battle. But Joshua and Caleb said, no, we could do this. God's good. He gave us this land. It's great. Let's go and do it. And as a result of that, Joshua and Caleb were blessed. They were the only two that were allowed to, to continue on while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until the rest of those people died. The people that brought back the evil report, they all died in the wilderness. They never even said, okay, you don't think we could do this? Then you're not going to see it. That was God's punishment. But Joshua and Caleb were blessed. I'm gonna, you're in Joshua 14. Look at Joshua 14. We're going to read a little bit about Caleb now. And the strength that Caleb had, even as an old man. Joshua 14, verse number 6. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Listen to this. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Now I'm going to stop right here. And I'll tell you, this is an encouragement for me. You know why? Because I'm turning 40 this year. 40 is how old Caleb was when he was sent to spy out the land. 40 years old, you should still be a strong man. You should still be a, you know, ready to fight in a war. You should have the strength to do that and have plenty of strength to keep going. That's where Caleb was. Verse number 8, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. <coughs> Excuse me, the land that they went and saw was a great land. They brought back the fruit of that land, and it was awesome. And as a result, because of their faithfulness, because of Caleb's faithfulness, God says, you know, I'm going to give you that land, because that was a really good land. I mean, the whole land they were given his inheritance was a good land, but that was, was an excellent land that, that he was given. Look at verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Caleb's 85 years old. He was 40 when he brought back word again. They wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years. He was out in the wilderness until he was 80 years old when they came in and finally were, were ready to start these wars and these battles. So five years now of warring and battling for Caleb. From the, year, from, from the time he was 80 years old, now he's 85 years old. Think about how many 85-year-olds that you know and what do they look like. Do you think about an 85-year-old man going out into battle and fighting a war? I don't know very many 85-year-olds that would, that would be ready or willing or able to do that at all. But you know what Caleb was? 
Verse 11, and listen to what he says here. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. He's saying, I'm standing here today, 85-year-old man, and I'm just as strong as I was when I was 40. It's saying a lot. Verse 12, now therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me. Then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. The Anakims were the giants. They were some of the people that were giants. These are the people that the people saw that brought back the evil report. These were the giants that were living in the land that the people said, we can't do this. And they fainted and said, oh, we're grasshoppers in their sight. We can't win this battle. Those are the people that were still living there when Caleb, at 85 years old, said, I want that mountain. I want that place where where those people were living. A mountain is a great place to have strongholds, by the way. And he was facing giants. He was facing a strong and a mighty people. And at 85 years old, Caleb didn't say, I'm too tired for this. I'm sick of fighting. I can't do the battle. I'm not strong. He says, I'm just as strong as I was back then. God strengthens me. God's blessing me because I'm doing the work that he has for me. Praise God. I hope that I'm saying the same thing at 85 years old. Willing to fight the battles, willing to go out and do whatever it is, great things to glorify God's name. And you know who gets the honor and the credit in this story? God does. Strengthening Caleb at 85 years old to still do those things. Why? Because his heart was willing. Because his soul was willing. Because he was willing to do it and he was willing to sacrifice and willing to trust in God and get his strength from God to do all kinds of wonderful things and to stay strong into his old age. If you can learn to push yourself, you could gain experience from that and then you'll know more of what you're capable of doing and be able to continue and push harder and more. And once you get through it, you know what? I've done this before. I've been here before. I could keep doing it. Caleb was rewarded for wholly, completely, entirely following the Lord God of Israel. Jesus wants you to follow him. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 15. Jesus wants you to follow him just as much as ever. He wants you to do the work that he has laid out for you. He wants you to follow in his steps. But he will also take care of you. Just as much as God took care of Caleb and, and strengthened him and helped him at 85 years old to continue to fight probably the hardest battle of his life at 85, where he needed the most strength ever. He didn't back down. He took it head on. Think about the strength that David needed as a young man, as a much younger man, when he faced up against Goliath. A man of war from his youth, strong and courageous and, and tested and proven in battle, and a man that just scared the living daylights out of every other warrior in the entire army of Israel. David had no fear. David relied on the Lord for his strength. David trusted in God that God's going to fight his battle for him. You know what he had to do, though? He had to be willing. He had to put himself out there. Matthew 15, look at verse 32. We're going to see some, some words from Jesus Christ himself. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting. Look at this. Lest they faint in the way. We need to be able to push ourselves. We need to be able to follow God. 
but we don't want to faint. But if we're doing that, like these people followed Jesus, they wanted to hear him. They didn't care. Look, for three days, they fasted. They didn't eat. People that wanted to hear what Jesus had to say so bad that they followed him into the wilderness. Well, what are we going to eat out there? I don't know, but we're just going to follow Jesus. They decided to do that. Did they die out there in the wilderness following Jesus because they didn't have any food? No, they didn't. Jesus performed a miracle to take care of them, to give them the strength that they need. Why? Because in their heart, they decided to wholly follow Jesus. They went out there and I just want, I want, I want to hear him. I want to follow him. I want to be with Jesus. Yeah, but you didn't bring any food with you. Yeah, but you're not, where are you going to sleep? I don't care. I want to be with Jesus. I want to follow him. It's uncomfortable. Hey, I don't know about you. I fasted for one day before, and that's really uncomfortable. Try fasting for three days, not only fasting, but walking around in the wilderness. That gets really uncomfortable. That could bring you to the point where you think, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to give up. I'm going to faint. Jesus saw the willingness and the desire. He says, you know what? I don't want them to faint, so I'm going to sustain them. I'm going to give them what they need to keep going. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. And they divided up the seven loaves and a few fishes and fed the multitude. 4,000 people. Jesus can provide the strength that you need to follow him. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. The last place I'll have you turn. Hebrews chapter number 12. I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15 reads, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This is the outlook we need to have. Look, the outward man's perishing, it's dying, it's getting weak, it, you know, have problems with the outward man, but the inward man, we can renew that day by day. How? By meditating on the Word of God day and night. Refreshing that inward man. And the afflictions that we deal with, the hardships, the pain, our light affliction, it's but for a moment. Our time here is short. That's why it says it's but for a moment. Our time is short. Kids, listen up. The time is short. It's hard to realize that when you're younger. I know I couldn't. You're going to grow up. And before you know it, you're going to look back and you're going to think, where did all that time go? We need to use the time. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Far more exceeding. The amount of work you put in now, God's going to bless you and give you far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory based on what you've done here. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are, not, which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We need to think about those things and look on those things that we can't physically see right now. That needs to be our driving factor. That needs to be the motivation. Our faith needs to be in it. Hebrews 12, we're going to close on this. Hebrews 12, verse number 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. There is a race set before, before you. 
So I didn't sign up for a race. You got saved. You got a race set before you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For we consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. This is so important for us to keep in mind. As you are wearied, as you experience that pain, as hardships come, as the persecutions come, think on Jesus and think about what he did. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. He was perfect. He deserved no problems. He deserved no punishment. He deserved nothing that he received. And these are sinners that are causing this on him. The perfect, only begotten Son of God in the flesh. Consider him and what he did. Consider him and his beatings. Consider him and his hunger. Consider him and his sleeplessness. Consider him and all that he did for you as you start to get weary. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ask yourself, did Jesus endure more than what I'm going through right now? Did he deal with more hardships? Did he deal with more grief and pain and suffering? You know what? The answer is probably yes. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, is what he said. And you know what? I know that's a fact for everyone here today. Fighting against sin, fighting against the weakness of the world. You haven't resisted yet unto blood, as Jesus did. Remember that and gain strength from that. As we mentioned this morning, Jesus Christ was fully human. He understands our infirmities, but he is the example of being able to push beyond your own infirmities and keep moving in the strength of the Lord. Let's look unto Jesus as we remember his birth today. And as we think about the next year ahead and the things that we want to do and the things that we're going to plan for and what are we going to accomplish with our life and what are we not going to allow anything to screw up that if I get anything done next year, it's going to be this. Think on those things for yourself. Remember all that he did for you. Can you tough it out a little bit for him? Yeah. Keep this in mind as you prioritize. Your day, your week, your month, your year, your life. Set goals for yourself. Push yourself to achieve those goals. And I don't want anyone to think that this sermon was directed at them in particular. Like I said, we have a lot of people with problems. I'm, I want to motivate you and stir you up. This, this sermon's for everybody. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, upset with anyone in our church. I'm not, uh, I'm not thinking that, that you know, people are failing necessarily or anything like that. But I know that we've had a lot of problems. And the only way that our church is going to accomplish our own goals. We've got a goal this year that with the salvations we're trying to meet. And it's not going to be easy to meet that goal. We have one week left. It's going to require sacrifice from people. It's going to require us to take the time out of whatever else is going on. It might require us to, to, well, in order to get this done, I need to do something else. I need to get some more sleep. I need to, get, I need to give up sleep. I need to give up something else in order to get this done. Well, that may be the case. Are you willing to tough it out a little bit for Jesus? Remember that. Remember his birth. Let's remember his death. Let's remember his resurrection. Let's remember all that he endured. When we get weary, let's plan for the future. Plan, plan to make it in church. Plan to read your Bible. Plan to pray. Plan to go soul winning. There's so many things that we need to be doing and filling up our day with when it comes to serving Christ. Let's not faint. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father,
Lord, <clears throat> we thank you so much for the encouragement that we have from these stories, from the people that you've used, from Caleb, from Jesus, from Joshua, from all the people that we read about here, dear Lord. Help us to be strong and courageous. Give us good success. Help us to make the sacrifices necessary in order to achieve that success. Lord, strengthen us. Strengthen our spirit. Strengthen our flesh. Strengthen our bodies to, to be able to keep pushing ourselves forward. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all that you've endured for us. The little bit that we have to give and to endure for you is, is really not that much. Help us to keep the proper perspective. Lord, help us to set the right goals for the future. Help us to plan and achieve great things that could bring just more honor, more glory unto you, and more people to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.